السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو ڈائلاگ ایم تیمور شامل انڈیا وی ہیو سین ریسنٹلی ہیز بیفل بائی دی ڈیولپمنٹس دیٹ آر ہیپننگ ایٹ دی انٹرنیشنل لیول یونائٹیڈ نیشنز ہیومن رائٹس کمیشن ان جون کیم اپ ود اے رپورٹ اینڈ دی دیٹ رپورٹ سیڈ دیٹ انڈیا از اٹمپٹنگ ہیومن رائٹس وائلیشنز گریو ہیومن رائٹس وائلیشنز ان کشمیر اینڈ دس از واٹ از ہیپننگ ان سائڈ کشمیر انڈین آکیوپائڈ کشمیر انڈیا continues the atrocities, continues to target innocent children and women in Kashmir. Many people, innocent people have lost their lives in Kashmir and Pakistan has brought up this issue again and again. Uh, baffled by this development, as I said earlier, India has been uh, attempting different tactics uh, and also maneuvers to uh, divert the attention of the world community, international community from the Indian occupied Kashmir and the atrocities over there. Yesterday, interestingly, there was a SARC uh, session going on on the sidelines of United Nations General Assembly. And yesterday, once again, India did what India is good at. India, uh, Indian Foreign Minister, Sushma Sabrad, the Ministry of External Affairs, she left this session abruptly. And uh, what Shah Mahmood Qureshi, Pakistan's Foreign Minister, said after she left, we'll listen to him and after that, we'll continue our discussion on Pakistan-India relations and what BJP government is up to now. ...educated to horrific treatment and the methods engineered by their security forces are unique to perpetrate maximum reign of terror. The recent report of the High Commissioner is evidence-based and evidence of atrocities collected from credible sources. It extensively covers details of unspeakable atrocities perpetrated by the Indian security forces against the Kashmiri people. The report recommends to establish a commission of inquiry to investigate the horrendous acts of Indian violations of human rights in occupied Kashmir. I call upon members of the contact group to endorse the findings of the report and exert their pressure on the government of India You just saw what uh, Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi, Pakistan's Foreign Minister, said uh, at uh, United Nations General Assembly's sidelines. Uh, there's also a very important point that this is not the first time India has backed out. Uh, India has been doing it earlier. A few days back, when Pakistan and India were scheduled to have uh, Foreign Minister's meeting at, on the sidelines of UNGA, India just backed out uh, within 24 hours. Uh, and later, the statements that were coming from Ministry of External Affairs, Indian Ministry of External Affairs, were undiplomatic, arrogant. And this also shows India's mood at the moment. Why is India doing this? And is India trying for peace and stability? It doesn't seem so. We'll have our discussion on Pakistan-India relations and also the political mood, the political gimmicks from the Indian uh, government at the moment. Our first guest is Ambassador retired Burhan al-Islam, a senior diplomat, a renowned uh, senior diplomat and an uh, ex expert on Pakistan's foreign policy, so working with the show. Our second guest is Air Vice Marshal retired Ikramullah Bhatti. He's a renowned senior defense analyst and expert on Pakistan's foreign policy as well, sir. Welcome to the show. Our third guest is Mr. Raja Kaiser. He is an expert on international relations and Pakistan's, foreign, uh, Pakistan's relations with India. Welcome to the show, Mr. Raja Kaiser. Ambassador Islam, starting with yesterday, uh, the uh, SAC session that was going on, uh, Ministry, Indian, Ministry of, Indian uh, Foreign Minister, she walked out of the session while the session was going on. Uh, this gesture by the uh, Indian uh, Foreign Minister, yet again, how do you see this? It's very unprecedented, I should say. Two weeks ago, we were looking at the possibility that there will be breakthrough in relations, breakthrough in the dialogue process between India and Pakistan, because with the new government in Pakistan, with a lot of positivity, Imran Khan with his vision, with his uh, uh, good understanding of relations with neighbors, and generally a positive person, I thought that possibly we are entering into new uh, uh, arena of uh, possibility of uh, dialogue between India and Pakistan. Sadly, things didn't go as analysts and we were expecting, unfortunately, because of Indian intransigence and their 
uncompromising and undiplomatic behavior and attitude that we have seen during the last two weeks. So that, uh, as you mentioned in our intro, that uh, the possibility of talks in India uh, uh, just last minute, 24 hours after agreeing to go for it, saying that we can't go and quoting instances which were very old and somehow they didn't know about the reasons they quoted it is routine between two countries not having good relations. So India, in my mind, should have ignored that and went to uh, New York and trying, should made an effort to talk to Pakistan. They would not have lost anything. But uh, since that ha had happened, I, I didn't expect that uh, in New York uh, things will be positive in any direction because that same behavior, same mood India is carrying to New York from Delhi, unfortunately. And uh, Sark provided an opportunity, and Imran Khan, in his letter to Indian Prime Minister, if you recall, had mentioned that before this Sark meeting, we could meet informally. And uh, it is not a dialogue, but at least a, an, a, a meeting to know about each other, each other's position on future relations between our two countries. Right. It could be a good, <clears throat> beginning of a relationship they could pursue in the next few months and years. But understandably, India is not yet ready for dialogue. And this is how they behaved very uh, uh, undiplomatically in, uh, at the SARC meeting. Normally, my experience in New York is that even if you don't like one party in New York, mm -hmm. you don't do this sort of stuff. You have gone there maximum, you'll shake hands, say hello, and don't criticize each other, don't talk about each other. But, but it's a courtesy. It's right? a courtesy. Right. Uh, that is what I've seen four years that I served in New York. But I was really baffled at seeing this sort of behavior. And, uh, and earlier, nothing. the kind of language that was used by the Ministry of External Affairs, Indian Ministry of External Affairs, very, that was very undiplomatic. So undiplomatic. This, this new trend of uh, Indian yeah. politics and uh, the trends that are being introduced in the Ministry of External Affairs. How that do you see is, that? That is very bad. Uh, earlier, we noticed that these, these Indian politicians, the Modi, the extremist RSS element, they would, if they have been doing in the past. And if they do, we, do, we are not surprised. The first time we are surprised, they are professional diplomats using language which is not proper, which is not uh, uh, anywhere in the world you would notice. Even in hostile mm. relations where right. you have, you try to be behaving in a sober manner as a professional because you are a technician. And that's what diplomats uh, do. And that's it. So this is a big failure on the part of India. I'm sure international community is taking note of that. Oh, okay. This is a type so, of behavior that we are seeing a country which we say, oh, great democracy. I think it's no more great. Right. And uh, AVM Bhatti talking about Indian Army Chief, uh, General Rawat. He is also repeating exactly the same thing, uh, what BJP is saying, uh, talking about war with Pakistan. So at the moment, what we see in India is some sort of war mongering and hate mongering inside India. Uh, why do you think is that? Well, you see, uh, I believe that Pakistan bashing uh, is an agenda which gets votes in India. In every election, Pakistan becomes an important issue a vote getter uh, for all Indian politicians. And now that we know that uh, in May next year, the, the Indians are going to be having their next elections. And uh, we also know that uh, BJP essentially uh, uh, attracts votes uh, with anti-Pakistan, anti-Muslim, Hindutva, uh, religious intolerance, in fact, military, uh, militant uh, in intolerance. Uh, towards uh, all uh, uh, minorities, especially Muslims. So with that in the background, uh, any uh, uh, attempt by the Indian government to come close to Pakistan would be counter to this uh, agenda. I think that was one reason that uh, the Indian uh, Foreign Office, uh, of course, uh, declined from that meeting or refused to uh, go ahead with that meeting. And it was regrettable that they, the words that they used were absolutely undiplomatic. And uh, the statement by the uh, Indian Army Chief, uh, you know, uh, is of course uh, basically a political and a very irresponsible statement. And highly political, you rightly said. Yes, 
and of course it is on the instigation uh, or on the behest of the Indian government uh, because we have had uh, situations in the past uh, when the tension was far uh, uh, greater even the forces had lined up on the border and there was patrolling going on yet we didn't go to the war and now in, in the present scenario when three of their policemen have died and one soldier has been killed and uh, they can't make these four deaths as a behest uh, for, for a war. And uh, more so when we know that the Indian armed forces today at, are at their weakest in terms of their morale, in terms of their training, in terms of their state of equipment and they have no justification or reason to go to war, to invade an, uh, a country which is their neighbour. So at this stage when the Indian Army Chief makes that statement, there is no reason other than of course uh, he right. is electioneering right. in, in, in favour of the government. Domestic politics, uh, Mr. Kesse as they say that uh, in the end all politics is local. Uh, we can see that uh, Indian Army is highly criticised and many experts are of the view that uh, the statement by the Indian Army Chief is basically directly favouring BJP <laughs> and we also know that Congress has been hinting to improve relations with Pakistan if they come in power uh, in the next uh, general elections. BJP stance is what our panelists are saying, Ambassador Islam and Air Vice Marshal uh, uh, Bhatti, that it's basically RSS and BJP and their anti-Pakistan uh, slogans that will make them win the elections over there. Do you agree with that? Oh, well, thank you, Taimur. Uh, well, there is a method in madness. This is not something that is sporadic. This is happening something or this is the continuation of something, you know, which is going really serious in India. You will have to look at at both state level and at the systems level. If you uh, want to make, you know, some kind of substantive an analysis of what is going on. Modi is facing perhaps the toughest of the challenges in the contemporary times in the past four years. Uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the political challenge in the form of, you know, that scandal uh, which, which he is facing right now, uh, that's, that's something really daunting, that's something really serious and that has hit him, you know, right on the head and this is something that's really damning to his credibility and this is something which has given his opposition parties a tremendous mileage to run over BJP, one thing. Secondly, uh, at systems level, you see uh, the developments, the way they have unfolded after that uh, UNICR report and it was really shattering to India because it was for the very first time when any international forum has actually corroborated whatsoever was going on in Kashmir. It was getting reported long ago, but there was no acknowledgement from the international community. So all, you know, if you, if you put these two major developments into a matrix, then that makes sense why Indian Army Chief and why BJP is behaving in this way. Plus when they are entering into an, uh, you know, an, uh, into an election year, they have already entered in fact. They will be running for elections in May 2019 and BJP has proven to be a total failure, a total catastrophe for India. Their demonetization, the way you know money has d been devalued in, in in the present times, the way you know all their uh, indicators they have gone drastically declined. All these things you know they have badly shattered the Modi myth. You know the myth of a Modi being a tough man or a muscular guy. Their Kashmir policy has outrightly <laughs> failed. Plus they wanted to isolate Pakistan within the region and internationally they failed miserably because China-Pakistan economic corridor has altogether changed the contours of region, you know, uh, if, with, with China's uh, explicit engagement with Pakistan. Right. So, you know, if you see all these things, so this frustration becomes the most likely scenario and this makes sense. Why, why BJP is behaving in this manner and why they are uh, actually, you know, going crazy over all these things. Right. So, if you see uh, the way they have behaved in past, 10 days when Premier Imran, he has uh, given a very positive gesture, though that was very untimely in the ruling dispensation in Islamabad, should have calculated uh, uh, this, uh, you know, calculus of the timing, if it is appropriate or not, given the impulse, domestic impulse, the way India behaves and the way it continues uh, and continued to behave in past four years, it was quite a likely outcome.
Right, but yeah. there were signs that India might be willing to improve relations, and since they no, said no, no. it, why that's would why they, Pakistan went for why would uh, extending they, sort of. Uh, why would they, when when they they are left with last you know six seven years in power, hmm. uh, sorry six months. seven months in power, oh, right. plus you know when they haven't interacted with because Pakistan. probably that is the only time left for BJP, and I would put this question to uh, Ambassador Islam that after Sushma Swaraj walked out, and she left this session, I would say she left this session. Uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi, he asked this question and the question was very interesting. He said, my question is, how is regional cooperation possible if the nations in the region are not ready to sit and you are the, uh, and they are the obstacles in those talks? So if India is not sitting in any session, if they're not willing to talk, then how can India talk about peace and stability in the region? Because that's what Sushma Suvraj was saying in that session, interestingly. She was talking about peace, talking about peace, but again, she left the session. Very unfortunate. You know, peace and development are so intertwined. And uh, this region will suffer if regional cooperation cannot be institutionalized. So people in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka w will suffer more because of one nation's intransigence, un understandable, inexplicable behavior, which we haven't seen in diplomacy for over years. You know. Uh, we thought that uh, it was a great idea that uh, originally SAC, as you know, it was the initiative of the former Bangladeshi president and uh, General Ziaul Rahman, the, his wife was opposition leader, was also prime minister several times. So now it is not the same government, but sh this present government of Bangladesh should own that in original initiative and the idea of regional cooperation in diverse areas, if not political, at least economic, or social, cultural, commercial. So this was the forum. So Bangladesh should have uh, taken a different stance than India. Last time also during that idea of uh, uh, the summit, SARC summit, which was supposed to be held in Pakistan. <coughs> and uh, when India said, we are not going Bangladesh, immediately this government consented. To my mind, they should have accepted cooperation of the region is important. This is an initiative by Bangladesh, so it is in their interest also to pursue this agenda, this side of cooperation in the region. I don't know why it is doing so. Obviously, it's under pressure from India, and they have they are having a lot of cooperation in the economic side recently. Possibly that's why they are going quiet and not saying much. Otherwise, as as, as I think Sri Lankan. Prime Minister of Foreign Minister said that, I mean, uh, we are the losers. I think uh, we are supposed to help uh, two countries if they don't have good relations within this forum also to talk and move forward to see any areas where we can work on. So I think uh, it's a bad situation and this cooperation cannot go anywhere to my understanding. So by, by showing this willingness to talk, mm. what Mr. Kess is also saying, when Pakistan showed its willingness to talk with India, uh, there are a few people, there are some people, they say that uh, perhaps it was too early for the for the present government to talk with India about uh, peace and, and stability, also knowing that BJP has a certain stance and the stance is anti-Pakistan and, and that war mongering. What do you think about this? As, as a, a foreign policy, perhaps, uh, initiative uh, to, let's say, to talk with India? To my mind, it was not a bad calculation. I mean, Imran Khan, uh, just took power and a lot of uh, globally there's a lot of interest in as to how Imran Khan talks about foreign relations, talks about Pakistan's relations with India. If he, he didn't say anything, basically what he said is responded to the message of Indian Prime Minister where he used the term that constructive engagement between the two countries should be considered at some stage. So he wanted constructive en engagement and in relations between two countries, what else is the meaning of construction, constructive engagement? So it means he invited that, let's talk about engagement of a sort. And Imran Khan rightly said, okay, let's talk about it. Let our ministers meet in New York. To my mind, it was a good idea. There's nothing wrong with it. As a forward looking person with a lot of popularity within the country with a mandate, popular mandate and global interest, in seeing that peace and development in this part of the world moves forward, I right. think it was a good initiative. Right. If he hadn't done that, 
what message that would have conveyed, we should think about that also. And Pakistan is gaining. Pakistan has gained because Pakistan of this, this initiative. Right. To my mind, Pakistan has gained. We have lost nothing. Right. India, on the other hand, has been exposed globally. That is a country which is really all for violence, all for uncompromising stances on foreign relations. So countries suffer because it's not only political relations between two countries, but also regional cooperation is hostage right. to our relations. Right. I'll take a break on this point that India, as you said, is showing aggression and violence in letter and spirit. We'll continue our discussion on Pakistan-India relations and the initiatives taken by Pakistan and the new government to improve relations with India, to have peace and stability in the region. And I will put this question after this break to Air Vice Marshal Bhatti, that Pakistan has shown a mature stance on the foreign policy front and also Pakistan's armed forces have, see, uh, have shown a very mature stance on the Indian aggression. We'll talk about this after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are discussing Pakistan-India relations and Pakistan's initiative at UNGA. Uh, Indian atrocities continue in Kashmir, Indian aggression continues in Kashmir, and Pakistan has brought up this issue of uh, aggression, Indian aggression in Indian occupied Kashmir at various platforms. Uh, Pakistan brought up uh, this issue uh, at the OIC meeting uh, on the sidelines of UNGA, and India, we see now, is baffled by the the developments regarding Kashmir at the international platform. Uh, it was much but you're talking about Pakistan-India relations. The way uh, Pakistan has responded to the BJP government, Pakistan's foreign office has responded to the uh, Ministry of External Affairs India, and the way ISPR has responded to the Indian uh, uh, Army Chief's uh, statements. How do you see those, uh, the, this response from the Pakistani side? I believe that uh, the first and foremost responsibility in the international arena for any new government is to uh, rebuild the image of Pakistan. And we know uh, with this uh, U.S. mantra of do more and Pakistan having these hideouts for the terrorists and the Indian uh, so-called Blame, blaming Pakistan for, uh, you know, causing terrorism in India, especially in the Indian held Kashmir. So uh, any new government would like to focus on uh, uh, building the image of Pakistan or uh, telling the world that we, we are not what we have been, uh, you know, assumed to be. So hence Pakistan's <laughs> invitation uh, for a meeting uh, between the foreign ministers was, I think, uh, a step which the Indians accepted uh, in, in the first instance yes. and uh, then even the Americans appreciated it and later on when our foreign minister uh, met with the US president and the US uh, uh, secretary of state and uh, even they assured and, uh, and uh, agreed to the need of resetting and rebuilding relationships but here is our neighbor who is just playing indifferent 
and uh, not only just indifferent, uh, you know, trying to be uh, belligerent and uh, almost uh, threatening of war. And uh, I think uh, the, the statement by the ISPR was uh, very wise, very balanced, that uh, we respect even the enemy's dead bodies and we treat them with honor. And uh, the allegation that the Indians had leveled was absolutely unfounded and false. And uh, while we are prepared to defend ourselves, but we, not, we are not for war, so that was a very uh, clear and a very balanced message, not, not just for the Indians, but for the world. And our, all our recent attempts at the uh, sidelines of the UNGA meeting, the OIC contact group meeting, the SARC, uh, uh, you know, having the SARC uh, conference uh, over there, was basically uh, an attempt to tell the world that Pakistan is for peace and we like to uh, undertake all possible efforts to uh, settle our differences with India and live in peace. And unfortunately, they have been avoiding uh, all such uh, opportunities, uh, letting them go by, playing indifferent, and uh, in fact, demonstrating to the world that who is more serious about peace and who is not. And it is unfortunate that uh, it is because of uh, India's, uh, uh, you know, such like attitude that uh, the region uh, is almost at a standstill. We have not had a SAG summit and there is no worthwhile uh, uh, cooperation between the regional countries uh, that come within the SAG. It's unfortunate because despite having a very useful, very effective, very meaningful platform, the, the regional countries have not been able to benefit from it just because of one, one country. And I think uh, our foreign office as well as ISPR have used this opportunity very well to tell the world as to what the reality is. Right. Uh, Mr. Kesar, United States and India, they have signed several defense pacts, in intelligence uh, pacts as well. United States and India would be working together. Uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Zalmay Khalil Zad, uh, and other uh, high officials, United States high officials were visiting Pakistan a few weeks back. And after that, they were at Delhi. Now, talking about Pakistan-India relations, the the American shadow on Pakistan-India relations, how do you see that? Because many people are of the view that <clears throat> this arrogance from the Indian side is also because of the support that India is getting from the American side. Uh, and the aggression continues in, in Kashmir because India thinks that India uh, is an answerable to United Nations Human Rights Commission, to any uh, uh, body uh, in the international arena. How do you see that? Well, this perception is quite legitimate. This is not something uh, which is out of the proposition. One thing uh, you see, uh, or what I perceive, is that American security calculus of South Asian region is pretty myopic. That's why they are suffering in Afghanistan as well. That's why they haven't had any uh, achievement, you know, in in India two decades of their you know, stint in Afghanistan. The reason being, you know, Americans had to try to reconfigure this region. This region, South Asia, traditionally had been India and Pakistan. What Americans did uh, primarily under Obama administration was to bracket Pakistan along with Afghanistan and to bracket India along with China, which we famously call as hyphenation and dehyphenation, which they had been doing. And, and this is something which had actually changed the trajectory of the region. So this, this is the basic fault line from where everything stemmed out. For instance, if you talk to Americans or if you talk to uh, you know, people who are there in their think tanks, recently I was there in New York and I had been uh, you know, uh, visiting different think tanks and then if you interact with the people over there, so they tell you very explicitly that uh, you know, we have our different terms of engagement with India and we have our different terms of engagement with Pakistan. So Pakistan should not be bothered with this thing that how we treat India, because these two are altogether different relationships. Well, this is not the case, because this, these things, they are being put into a reciprocal matrix. Reason being that if you will be extending all out cooperation to India, it has a direct impinging on Pakistan's security. If you will be giving India an access to a nuclear suppliers group or if you will be giving them an access to this uh, uh, uranium market and you will be giving them all you know covers which which they can't get since being non-signatory to npt 
So how can you expect that there can be a sustainable peace in the region? So America's role in this region or this regional stability is very doubtful, it is very suspicious because they, they are actually favoring India or they are, you know, making India a new bully on the block which could you know deter China and which could actually satiate their uh, security you know uh, kind of mindset or, or these their calculations about the region which they had conjectured about the region. So if, if you think in, in, on these lines so that seems very unreasonable. Secondly when it comes to uh, you know relationship between India and Pakistan I am of the opinion that both these position of hawks and doves they are, they are pretty flawed in, in, in this region. Reason being, you know, uh, well, we, we are not uh, hawks. We don't advocate any kind of aggression or any kind of war mania or war mongering or hate mongering between both the countries. But at the same time, you should realize the fact that the desire for peace should be reciprocal. Na? There should be diplomatic reciprocity. What Indian Foreign Office is continuing to do in, in last one or two years is is so unprofessional, it's so undiplomatic. It, it is, right. And, and at the same time, and the kind of recalcitrance which they are pursuing with, hmm. I mean, that that's against the spirit of the diplomacy. So and now the bigger question is, yeah. bigger question is, Ambassador Islam, that what are the options for Pakistan now? Because uh, Pakistan, China, both working on mega economic activity, China, Pakistan economic corridor, uh, Saudi Arabia would be joining in on a couple of projects. We want other countries also to join in because ultimately, not just Pakistan, but the region would benefit from the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. But on the other hand, since we are talking about United States and Indian relations as well and its impact on the regional politics for that matter, how do you see this? That uh, China, uh, India is also a part of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, member, but India doesn't want to have good relations with most of its neighbors. How do you see that? You see, Pakistan, I think, should continue with its posture of showing interest that we want peace in the region, of course, peace within the country against counterterrorism. Our measures should continue. And with India, we should remain positive. But to my assessment, that with India, we cannot expect a breakthrough in relations till the the minds of the Indian present rulers change. A fundamental change we need about their stance on Kashmir and relations with Pakistan because it has clearly come out this time with their uh, refusal to continue with discussion and dialogue is that they are not interested in long-term peace with Pakistan. I think they want to gain time, buy time, continue with their negative and aggressive posture vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir so uh, I think in the next year or so, we cannot, we don't expect, we shouldn't expect positive movement. Even if you talk, go to the table, what do you talk to them? Because they haven't changed, if they don't change their stance on Kashmir and their interest in regional cooperation and all that, for whatever reason, domestic politics possibly is first. I think there cannot be any real proper path of peace that we can pursue the two countries. while. That remains maybe so. We should try to ensure that there is no aggression, there is no uh, belligerency on the part of India. Keep them calm and quiet. Elections are coming. They will try to talk about many things, surgical or non-surgical, yes. whatever operation they are trying to coin those terms these days. We don't believe this is what they, they are capable of. But as regards the other countries, Pakistan, I think, should pursue its the good policy that we have Imran is reviewing a little bit some of the aspects of CPAC. I think good idea. So the Arab has uh, shown interest, apparently, as we see from the statements of the government officials and the ministers. The Saudis are keen on helping Pakistan. I think it's a positive side. We should also try to engage Iran, if possible, in some way. If on CPAC, because we shouldn't care much about what the Americans say, but I think in some form we should uh, have some sort of economic relations with Iran also, so that we have balance with Saudi Arabia and uh, and Iran. And if they also are in a position to invest few couple of billions of dollars on CPAC, we should be considering seriously. And this gas pipeline issue the with Iran, I think, should be revived. To my mind, this is time to start with American 
and nods and their interest and disinterest should not influence our policy and relations with Russia should be pursued very seriously at this stage. And, and perhaps, it was Marshal Bhatti, that this is what also uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan hinted at when he was in Saudi Arabia and he said that there is this, this war going on in the Muslim world and that we need to put an end to the chaos in the Muslim world. By saying this, uh, it was well received in the Muslim world that he's talking about having better relations among the Muslim states. Iran for that matter and Saudi Arabia and other countries and Yemen for that matter. How do you see this statement and uh, uh, having better relations with the neighbors? You see, uh, while this statement is of course uh, very, uh, you know, very welcome within the Muslim world and it's very constructive. Uh, but to begin with, you see, Pakistan must uh, first of all come into a position where it becomes more relevant and where it gets to be heard. And for that, I think our focus should be, uh, should be first on making ourselves politically stable and economically strong. And if we are, we are achieve these two targets, then we will be heard anywhere and everywhere in the world. We, we get exploited just because of our, these two weaknesses. And as regards, you see, uh, our options with India uh, and, and with the Muslim world, they will improve, they will increase the moment we are, you know, politically stable and economically strong. We, we have, you know, this international forum, as you know, we have already tried that. Unfortunately, it has not worked. But I think we, at the regional level, we have SEO, which can be more effective than UNO as far as the relation between India and Pakistan are concerned. Because I believe China is one country in the world which, uh, besides Pakistan, is will be the most interested in a good relationship between India and Pakistan. Okay. Right. But since we talk about India and Pakistan relations and better relations, many experts are of the view that it doesn't matter if Congress is there in power in India or BJP is in power. When it comes to Pakistan, they're almost the same. Do you agree with that? No, I think Congress, uh, uh, at least on the face of it, appears to be relatively more pragmatic and no, not so much, uh, you know, uh, extremism driven or uh, it, it more, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't believe in Hindutva and it, 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 people are a little more comfortable and it, it doesn't have that religious intolerance. And uh, we, we, from the, on that count, I think we can uh, be a little more hopeful towards Congress, whereas we've had even good relationship in the time of BJP earlier on. But I think uh, under the present circumstances, uh, Congress may be uh, in a better position to uh, have uh, mediation with Pakistan and you know, sort out our differences. And uh, be it Congress or BJP, I think the, the Chinese or uh, you know, even the Russians can have uh, a favorable influence in the, uh, to the question of India-Pakistan, good relations and peace. Right. Uh, Mr. Kesef, uh, there's, there's Pakistan's willingness to talk for peace with India. And as you were saying earlier, India is not reciprocating. Uh, India doesn't agree with uh, the less serious talks, less serious, let's say, topics, trade for that matter, people-to-people -people interaction. When Army Chief met Navjat Sidhu, who was here, uh, when Prime Minister Imran Khan took oath, Army Chief met him, and Navjat Sidhu was extremely criticized in India, and especially by the BJP and the TV channels and the newspapers backed by BJP, interestingly. So when we talk about people-to-people -people interaction, when we said that we would be opening the Kartarpura uh, uh, border area so that the Sikhs can visit their uh, shrine here in Pakistan, they aren't happy with that. They aren't happy with talking about Kashmir. What does India want and what are the options for Pakistan then? <clears throat> well, Tamur, uh, one thing which should be very clear that, you know, the foreign policy, the construct of foreign policy has a very little scope for innovation. Usually it is all together a status quo construct. I mean, you cannot much play around unless, you know, you, you, can, you can be just, you know, fixing the basis of the foreign policy or seldom we come across any paradigm shifts in foreign policy. Right. So for that matter, you know, uh, Pakistan, one thing, you know, which, which Pakistan can do that we have been investing a lot in track two and track three vis-a-vis -vis India, why not we, we, we employ these kind of track two and track three with, with our other regional players mm -hmm. as well, with Iran for that matter, for instance, Russia, for instance, Afghanistan. So 
I think we have pretty uh, a lot of active track two uh, uh, dialogues going on with Afghanistan for that. Yeah, yeah, and not much. Maybe yeah, perhaps yeah, with, but, with but Iran or some, Russia. Something, but something more a proactive, regional approach, uh, a multilateral diplomacy, which which should be aiming at doing uh, or achieving something which is uh, substantive, or or which is something you know which can actually help Pakistan's national security or or. Or something in you know, a national interest for that matter. So explore so, more options, more avenues. Yeah, more in, avenues in the region. Right. So uh, unless and until you know this Modi government is there, you cannot expect any kind of serious mm. engagement right. between both the countries. Mm. India twice has missed the chance. Mm. I mean, twice they had the, the the initiative and twice they missed it. One when Premier Nawaz decided to attend the swearing in ceremony of Premier Modi, right. and and that was the time when it this. This uh, gesture or move of him was not welcomed in his country, but still he went a step ahead. He went an extra mile and he attended the ceremony. That was the time where India could have capitalized on. Second thing, when this time, when both, you know, in, 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 under Imran, when civil military relationship is somewhere onto a harmonious mm -hmm. trajectory, this time India could have capitalized and should have capitalized on it. I, I believe they have, they have missed the chance. I will, I'd would like to this point that India has missed the opportunity. India has right. no doubt right. about it, and I don't know how it can be brought back to track. It may take some time to my reading, but one I'll go back to the previous topic sure. if we allow. That's about the uh, relations with the regional countries. I think Pakistan can make a breakthrough with Bangladesh, and it is very important that we should take Bangladesh out of the Indian track and basket by suggesting, you remember that Imran Khan suggested that 2.5 million Bengali population or Bihari people in Karachi should be given passport and ID. Right. I think it's a great gesture. Our foreign policy should, foreign ministry should think about it and try to take advantage of that, send a special envoy to Dhaka and to tell that, look, you have a, this much a big population that we are offering citizenship. Right. And yes. while India is trying to kick out about 30, uh, 3 million, I think, of Bangladeshis who went in 1970. Right. While we are allowing your 2.5 million citizenship or ID card of some sort, I think it's a great gesture from Imran Khan. I would say he's a visionary man if he had thought about that our relations with, with Bangladesh should improve. Right. And this is how we can take India, Bangladesh out of Indian you know, influence. So send an envoy, foreign officials should seriously think about and improve relations with Bangladesh and with Sri Lanka, we are in good track and rest of the countries we already know. This is an excellent, excellent point that improving relations with Bangladesh and perhaps also individually focusing on all the South countries, countries and, and, and we can improve our relations with, with shortly, yeah. we are short of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Afghanistan, Pakistan has also started pursuing, you know, some very, uh, you know, warm uh, gestures. For instance, we are hosting Afghan students. Uh, from Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Who, are, who, yeah, who are studying at, at, at uh, you know, different universities. On scholarships. Yeah, on scholarships in right. Pakistan. This is something, you know, which, which really cultivates a goodwill mm. um, in, in, in other countries about you. And, and the rest of the countries which, has, which had a suspicion mm. about Pakistan's right. role, that should be perhaps eliminated through proactive diplomacy. Oh, certainly. And Pakistan should really work right. on that. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you for joining yes. us, Mr. Uh, Islam. Pleasure having you on the show. Yes. Uh, Evas Marshal Bhatti, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Mr. Kesar, thank you for joining us. India continues its aggression in Kashmir, and we have been talking about this. Uh, I would just conclude what our panelists said. There are options certainly for Pakistan, and by being open to peace talks with India, Pakistan has been gaining. The response from Pakistan to the Indian aggression is very mature on the foreign policy front, and also uh, the way Pakistan military has responded to the Indian military is also very mature. That was a mature act because Pakistan stands for peace and stability in the region. But any sort of misadventure from the Indian side would also be reciprocated and paid back in the same coin. Thank you for watching uh, today's program. See you next time. Da.